me up. Yeah. You, you up. But, uh, and we do have we do have three people on, so we're we're getting close, but uh, somewhere there's a an echo. So yeah, you, Mike's we can't, and I don't see Ryan and Randy yet. So okay, but I I do have a camera, it's on. You get you're getting feedback. That's happened last week too. You're getting echo on you. Uh, let me see what the comments. See what we got here. Streamyard. Bill Sell put up a note. Michelle. Uh, Michelle is there. Jim Roy is there. Hi guys. I'm glad you came early. I I went live manually. So anybody that's out there went live manually, and I'm waiting to see um, if. All right, wow. I'm going to kill your voice, John. I'm going to kill you here. I'm going to try to get Ryan and uh, Randy. What the heck? That's funny. No. Huh. Wonder who you're getting. So, so I killed the phone, but now I'm still getting. The, there you go. All right, you're there, but I'm getting a background. Oh what? I'm getting background. You're echoing. Um, Maybe because I'm on the phone and you in the house or? Yeah, I'm in the house, regular spot. Right, let me see if I can get uh, Randy. Okay, it's Ryan. Okay. All right, Ryan, I can I I got you and uh Zoom. Oh, I'm trying to turn the volume up. Okay. You're getting a little feedback and I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm gonna turn I'm going off the phone. I'm gonna turn the phone off. Yep. All right, how's that? Okay, Ryan, you're okay. So everybody stick with us because we will persevere here. Yeah, Bill, I got off that. I, um, no, John, talk again, John. Um, I am talking now. I'm not on the phone, so. You're fine, Ryan. You okay? Yep. Can you hear okay. me? All right. And we got 10 people. So thank you for sticking with us, guys. Um, it's a free show. So... So we are live, so it's taping. Bob, uh, not only do we have Ryan, Ryan live, we have Ryan live on tape from yesterday. Oh boy, that that that's true. So so should should we skip the opening intro? And um, well, we can skip the opening intro, but not skip our opening sponsor because our sponsor is uh, our yeah, key. Well, that's that's true. We we can. Go ahead, John. Check. Take okay. it. Hi, everybody, and welcome once again to the early birds here at RVing in New England. And my name is John Petro. Bob Zagami is with me. We've got a great lineup tonight, and um, we want to thank our sponsor friends at Seacoast RV on Route 1 in Saco, Maine. They have crop park models. They have elevation park models. They have Winnebago towables as well as motorized and um, they're nice people. The other thing with Seacoast that I've been able to take advantage of on several occasions is they have an easy fill propane area where, um, you know, you just pull right up, they come right out with the long hoses, put it in. And um, in the meantime, you go in the store and browse, say hello to one of the three or four dogs that they have there, black labs, golden labs, etc. cetera. But, um, it's cool. So that is our sponsor. Yeah. So and Ryan is gone somewhere. And I just sent I just sent Randy a text, but we can we can certainly style with Ryan and see if uh, see if Randy catches up to us. I apologize, folks, but Facebook has a major issue tonight, and they are not allowing anybody to uh, schedule a program. So we had to do a little few things. Unfortunately, I. Got a whole, you know, old safety valve, Bill Sally's at a conference in New York. He took my call. He walked me through a couple of things, figured out how to go 
live manually. So we are live. We got nine people there. And no. we should thank you. What? If we get a couple of minutes before uh, we go into the RV stuff, a lot of people might not be aware of the fact that if, if you look behind Ryan's right shoulder, you'll see three two numbers back there, number 37 and number three. We know number three is Dale Earnhardt's original number, but a lot of people might not be aware that Ryan is also and has been a race car driver, both in the dragster fields as well as, what do you call it, the ovals? Uh, yeah, circle track. Circle track. So, Ryan, what, tell us a little bit about, um, you know, when when you're done on the end of the day on Friday um, fixing RVs, probably the last thing that you want to do is Andy. jump in an RV and go somewhere. Yeah, so, that sounds about right. You know, so you... Um, well, you're rebuilding you know, right now. Are you racing now or you, you? I know you were rebuilding something. I bought a, I, so I sold, sold the car last year and I bought a new one about a month ago and, uh, kind of like a barn find car. And, uh, so I'm, I took the motor and transmission out of it and all the wiring and I'm replumbing it and rewiring it and, uh, redoing the motor and transmission. So you're, cool. not, you're not actually racing this year. You're just getting ready for next year. Yeah, it'll be a, it's a, a winter project. I'm doing it my way and the way I want to do it and everything. So, yep. well, the racing season. Isn't, that, isn't that the way you do everything, Ryan? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh, Bob, my brother just called a few minutes ago. He's on his way down to the um, Martinsville, Virginia track where NASCAR is there this weekend. He's going to the, to the modified race on Thursday night and then heading back up to Stafford Springs. So there's evidently another big race up there right this weekend, Ryan, right? Yeah, the fall final got canceled. It was supposed to be like the beginning of October, and it kept get, it got canceled two weeks in a row. So now they're doing their fall final uh, oh, Saturday. Okay. okay. So you know what, Bob? We are um, it is, we are officially we're officially. Yeah, yeah, we're not we're not going to mess around with the uh, the titling and the music and yeah. get right into it. And I'm listen. not even going to mess around with the right shirt. Huh? That's right. You got the wrong shirt. <laughs> So let's, do, let's let's go to the top. We got Jim Roy. He was on early. Uh, appreciate that, Don Haas. You're back in Rockport, Texas. And how and is how is the wife, how is the wife doing, Don? She was sick there. Had I think she had some surgery. Michelle, the show where we have um, get well. Um, no, we already took care care of that, uh, Michelle. We, that was John and I were on the phone. That's why we were getting that. Uh, yes, you, yep, on the laptop, Michelle. Says, Let me uh, now while I do that, before before I forget, let me see. Boom, boom, boom. Randy wins the Jim Roy lookalike <laughs> contest. Yeah, all right. Before, before I forget, we got we got to do a, a quick commercial for Michelle. Michelle has decided to sell her grand design trailer that has got all kinds of upgrades and features and fees from sponsors and what have you 33,000 but go find Michelle's page click on that where it says 2020 grand design travel trailer on the bottom and she's got a whole list of what's on the unit and some videos and she has solar that Ryan put on for her a couple of years ago what the hell is she doing up on the roof Huh? Showing, showing well, off my great work. I think she was doing this segment for um, Rolling on TV. They featured it on Rolling on TV, so she went up on the roof. So anybody needs that. Hey, Murray, did, did they shut the electricity off up in Burlington or wherever the hell you are? I'm in uh, Mountainville, Pennsylvania. Mountainville, Pennsylvania. Oh, wow, that store looks just like South Burlington, Vermont. Because I put it together. Oh, <laughs> Uh, that, he has he has the only yesterday. legit RV background out of all of us. <laughs> yeah, I have a fake really one. yeah. I'm, I'm Bob eating, doesn't even have one. I'm eating lobster rolls at, at uh, Portland Head Lake. There you yeah, go. and he's uh, in Florida. That's 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 right. That's a little bit better. So, anyway, we have a great show lined up, and uh, ironically, yeah, it's time to winterize. Ryan came over to our place on. Uh, Monday, we winterized. We were supposed to get a frost yesterday morning, which we just about did. And today, when I was out at two o'clock, it was seventy-four degrees, and I think tomorrow's supposed to be warmer. Now, 
our so, place or Fuller's place? Of the Fuller place, the place where I have where you, my, my unit. Where and, you use the unit. He had a nice conversation with Matt Fuller, who we hadn't met before. And did you, um, did you do a video while you were there? We did. I sent it to you to Everybody, play. We were at Fuller RV. We're in Boylston, Mass. And uh, you know what? This is like hitting the uh, Bonanza, the lottery. We've got two of the best, without question, the best RV maintenance people in the entire Northeast, if not the country. We've got Ryan Hadley from Trick RV, and we've got Matt Fuller from Fuller RV. Um, Matt, you get to work on all your own. You get to work on your 80s stuff. <laughs> not 80s, but... 80 units and Ryan um, you're working on at least 80 or 100 of these uh, units in these last couple of weeks with just winterizing. Just winterizing right now. So let, let me ask you the million million dollar question. What is, let, let's just think of the, the top three things that um, RV owners need to consider as they put their unit away for the winter. Well, one of the biggest things is winterizing. Don't forget to winterize, empty your water tanks, empty your uh, fresh water tank and your black and gray water tanks. Hmm. And Ryan, you've, I mean, and Matt, you've got a lot of things that you do here with these units behind us. Um, obviously, winterizing is one. Anything else that you look for at this time of the year? Yeah, we try to check the roofs, make sure that all your seals are good, make sure around the tub, the sky dome doesn't have any cracks in the seals and stuff. and just really inspect your roof because uh, when all that snow and ice comes, you don't want the water getting under and uh, making re wreaking havoc. Yeah. So, Ryan, um, you deal with different people every day, and there's been so many new RVers that have come into the RV lifestyle in the past few years. What's the craziest question that you've had people uh, ask you that were newbies? Uh, anybody did not know that you had to cl clean your tanks or um, uh, anything like that? I've got a lot of people that don't understand the whole process of the fresh water tank with the water pump and the city water. They just, they think you have to have the water pump on when the city water's on. So explaining simple stuff like that to people that just weren't, weren't explained that at the dealerships. Hmm. Final words, Matt. Uh, go RVing, life's a trip. Go RVing, life's a trip. <laughs> okay, there we go. Two of the top RV Techs in New England uh, sharing a few thoughts with us as we head into the dreary long winter months. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs> Randy, what, what would your top three be, Randy? I mean, those guys, the water system, obviously, roof seals. I mean, I've been talking about that since uh, Christ was a corporal. Um, it, it definitely, uh... <laughs> Wait a minute. What was that? A long time. <laughs> <laughs> so the roof seals are the most one of the most important things that's going to take the brunt of the weather right um mm -hmm. plumbing system um i'm also checking in i i when we're doing an orientation and we're talking about maintenance with our customers we're talking about um looking at the side seals just training yourself to look for things that may cause issues later and if you are constantly looking for those um hopefully you can address them or at least be aware of them and take care of them in a timely fashion. And so I look at the sidewalls as well. I'm, I'm when we're not using an RV, um, that's when maybe some more significant damage happens because we're not actively in and out of it. We're not there to see a, a water infiltration or an issue that may compound um, with, uh, with with time. Um, also, warm and cold with water will open up cracks, and water will get in, freeze, expand the crack, and make it worse and keep compounding. So that's what I'm looking for. Same Just as like frost teams, right? Just like frost teams. Frost teams right. on your RV, yeah. yeah exactly. <laughs> let, me so, take, let me take a step back because we've heard from many people that winter camping is increasingly popular and more people are stretching the season. And here in New England, the ski, the ski, uh, ski resorts, snowmobiling places are seeing a lot more RVs. So what advice do you have for somebody that's going to do winter camping? Do you have a different procedure? Do you have Florida, a Florida? And Ryan, I'll ask, I'll ask you first, Ryan, then we'll go back, back to Randy. But how are you guys, are you seeing a lot of winter camping? Are you seeing people come up here and say? I see, I see a lot of people within the last few years that are living in their campers. Um, on, whether it be on a piece of property or it be at some camp, there's like three campgrounds around the, this Massachusetts area that are uh, year round. And uh, 
see a lot of people that are living in them. And the biggest thing with that is to keep your water from freezing, obviously. And it's wrapping the outsides, whether it be uh, with hay bales, styrofoam, I mean, um, insulation, and also keeping your tanks warm. If you're not equipped with an Arctic package, putting tank heaters on your tanks to keep the, um, the black and the gray tanks from freezing and the freshwater tanks from freezing, because a lot of these campgrounds that are open year round, they don't offer water. You know, when, once the season closes, they shut off the water. They'll mm-hmm. allow you, maybe they'll leave a spigot on somewhere up by the office so you can get water. But biggest thing is keeping the water from freezing and, and trying to insulate the camper as best as possible so you're not blowing through a lot of propane for, with the heater. Mr. Murray. <laughs> I guess um, to, to expand upon what Ryan said, it depends if you're using water or not. So being from northern Vermont, I am very accustomed to what a ski area is like um, and, and know what come along with that. So I've got lots of customers that do utilize their RVs, and especially now with some of these newer RVs that are kind of like the the four-wheel drive vans um, and adventure vehicles that we're seeing uh, more predominant in the industry. Um, Those guys, they bought those to go snowboarding, to skiing, their four-wheel drive. They they bought them to go off-road with and things like that. So um, if they – the the conversation kind of goes, do you plan on having water or not using water? Well, no, we're not going to use water because we're already winterized. We're just kind of going to use it as a, you know, a place to have lunch and a place maybe to get out of the elements and uh, recoup and stay overnight or what have you. So at that point, I'm telling the customer, flush your toilet with antifreeze. Bring a couple gallons of antifreeze with you. Flush the toilet with antifreeze so the the um, waste that's going down into the black water tank is mixed with antifreeze. It won't freeze with that. Um, and then we can go ahead and dump that when we get a chance. Um, If we are using water, and this is where some customers don't quite understand um, that a inch and a half wide wall or thick wall is not going to keep the cold out and the warm in quite as effectively as, as say, our homes do with six inch wide walls in basements that uh, go down below the frost line. So um, uh, if we are using water, Um, I I tell the customer, make sure you have a backup plan for your backup plan. If your furnace goes out, this thing is going to cool down very quickly. Have some sort of uh, supplemental heat source. Um, Be able to winterize it at a moment's notice if uh, you do lose your heat or if an issue arises. So um, we kind of will go through those steps. If you are camping or living in it throughout the winter months, um, as Ryan mentioned, skirt the unit. Keep the air out from underneath the unit. If the wind can blow under the unit, that's really going to be pulling a lot of heat out of the unit. And with that, uh, that skirt around the unit, whether it be hay bales, insulated skirt, whatever it may be, um, if you can bring your city water up into the middle of it and heat that um, with some sort of heat tape, as we do in like a mobile home park, that's probably going to be the most effective way there. They also sell, um, they sell, you know, you can buy garden hoses that are heated, heated garden hoses. Those are very popular. Um, it's, it's just really, really, really hard to live in a camper in the winter. They're not designed for it. Right, right. Yep. Right. Now, let me ask one question before we were talking about now people that are living in their units for the winter, but for the majority of us that put it away, Ryan, I think there's one thing that you've noticed that people forget um, when they're doing their do-it-yourself winterizing, and that is the hot water tank, right? Yep. I actually, the beginning of this year, I did one or two hot water tanks from splitting, and the customers actually admitted to me that they winterized their whole unit themselves. They were so proud of themselves, but they forgot to drain. They bypassed the water heater, but they forgot to drain it. So, <laughs> cracked it went. Yep, yep. Jerry brought up an interesting point before. He said, um, how about the critters that you have to deal with either um, if it's going to be dormant or if you're going to be in it, the last thing you want to do is share your pillow with a, uh, you're never going to share it with a mouse. Randy, right? Because there's no such thing as mouse. <laughs> right. <laughs> they would be mice. Um, it, keeping um, critters out of your coach can be challenging. And I'm sure Ryan has fixed as many uh, chewed wires as I have. I've, I've seen lots of and lots of things tried. Um, lately, we've been using, and I think we've talked about it before on the show, a mouse free product, which is uh, a product out of Canada that is uh, a liquefied petroleum jelly that we actually atomize and we apply to the frame rails um, in the places that mice would get into a camper. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Once a mouse, once a, once mice get in, it, it, it's all over. So if you're putting bounce dryer sheets and Irish spring soap on the floor, 
um, they're they're in by that point. They're already in the underbelly where all the where all the magic happens. Let's say where that's where the wires are and the things that they're going to damage. So at the floor level, they're they're already they're well underway, <laughs> right? So I'm um, trying to keep them out. Uh, parking in low grass, high grass um, gives uh, rodents cover from predators. Um, so if you can park in low grass situations or in paved lots, a um, lot less apt to have uh, rodent intrusion that way. Um, the mouse free works really well. Uh, being a presence. Um, being in and out of your camper on a regular basis throughout the winter months, opening the door, walking around, uh, but giving your dander. If you've got pets, bring them in. That that all helps. But uh, take the food out and do common sense goes a long way. Hey, Randy. Ryan, what's, far, Tim, what's, far, Tim talking about? Huh? what's Tim Ryan? What's Tim talking about? 14 by, famous 14 by 22 skylights in the bathrooms are guaranteed failure. Um, I think he's talking about how they there was a thing where the skylights – they were screwing them down too tight and um, they were cracking on some applications. So I'm not sure. Maybe that's what he's talking about. A freeze when it freezes, maybe gets a crack. Mr. Hawkey, uh, Mr. Hawkey yep. in the house. Randy. Is this woman a part of your fan club, Randy? So Megan, actually, you've met Megan. She is our events coordinator for Pete's RV, and uh, I'm oh, a big okay. fan of hers because she usually takes care of me on the hotel room side of things. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Randy, for, oh, for well, once, I just didn't, I just didn't relate it to it. For Randy, for once, we're not talking to you from a. She's awesome, room. and she takes really good care of us. So uh, Megan is Megan is my people. <laughs> She's a big, big part of the team. Yeah. Yes. For <laughs> once, we're not talking to you from a dimly lit hotel room. Who's who's saying that? I said for once we're not talking to Randy from a dimly right. lit hotel. Room. Right. No, we're just talking from a dimly lit pots department in, <laughs> in, right. in exactly. which, Virginia. What's no, that? I'm sorry. Pennsylvania. Virginia or Pennsylvania? Pennsylvania. I'm in Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania currently. And let's ask Kevin where he is if he's in Elkhart. And I'll also ask Kevin if he's gonna be in um in Quartzsite. I'm trying to make it out there this January. Kevin, are you going to be out there? I know that uh, Keystone has a pretty good sized display of cougars out there every year. So you still haven't uh, got that trip all planned out yet. I've got it all planned out. I've got it on the map. It's 12 days out and a few days there, and fly back for the Boston show, and then fly back to Phoenix, oh. and um, come back, and then go to Florida. And I know he doesn't go. To, he doesn't go to Las Vegas. Jeff, Jeff might go. Uh, yeah, I assume yeah. Jeff. Hockey, you don't go to Las Vegas, do you? I don't. I don't think he does. Oh, the, oh, for that for that event, yeah. We got the RBDA convention yeah. coming up to the week after next. Yeah. Uh, so let me ask you guys again: um, the biggest mistake people make of of not doing. Um, Thinking they've got it done, or thinking they don't have to do it. Ryan, is there is there one thing that you see that is neglected more so than anything else? Uh, I mean, I wouldn't say there's things not neglected. There's just things that people oversee. Like I get a lot of phone calls around this time of year. Within the next couple of weeks, like my winterizations are pretty much done. I have a few to do next week. I've been doing them for about two weeks now, um, about six or seven a day, and. Um, I'll get the people within the next couple of weeks that'll say, Oh, I forgot to call you and winterize my camper. Like people just, they, it's like a afterthought for them. Like, it, like this 40 foot thing sitting in your driveway doesn't ring a bell when you come home at night. You would think people would think about it. I mean, it's, it's on my mind and it's on my mind of, of customers that I know probably need a winterization that are going to call me in a couple of weeks and say, Oh, I forgot all about it. You know, it's just oh, one of the brought up a good one. Ice makers and washing machines. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Hookies in New York, not going to Quartzsite. You know, another thing too, people always tell me like when I'm doing a winterization, I always ask them, is there any like hidden water fixture that I don't see? that you may know about, or is there a washer and dryer hookup, even though you don't have one? And people always say, oh yeah, we have a washer and dryer. We have an ice maker, but we never use it. Well, that doesn't matter. Water <laughs> still gets there. So you need to open the valves and let the water through and the antifreeze through. They get to, just because you don't use an appliance, like if there's a shutoff valve to your ice maker, you can unhook it at the shutoff valve and let the pressure go through with the water out of it, unhook the line. But, 
just because you don't use it doesn't mean there's not water sitting there, especially with the with the uh, washing machine, because you don't know if if maybe the dealership when they pre prepped it they ran the washing machine to make sure it worked or however that works. You don't know that, so you still. I always do a load. I always put the washing machine on and run it through a cycle. Yeah, hmm. and That's I, I know C, I know Seacoast, Randy. I don't know if you're doing this or Ryan, but Seacoast this year started adding surcharges if you had a dishwasher or a washer or an ice maker because it's added. yeah so there's a generic fee that i get for winter ice. it also depends on where you're located too because of the drive time but if you have a washing machine ice maker even a dishwasher some of these campers have dishwashers now it's an extra fee because it takes me longer to do it and it's more antifreeze yeah yeah hey guys um Oh, I had a great idea. Oh, let's let's get over this right now. Randy, there might even be behind you. Um, we get that question. I, I belong to so many different Facebook groups on various aspects of RVing. And, you know, this topic comes up every year. Why should I spend money on an RV cover when I can go to Home Depot and buy one of those blue tarps and just bungee cord it? Um... You want to damage your RV? <laughs> yeah. so, do, you want, um, do you want to ruin everything on, on the side of your RV and the roof? Yeah, the smileys. So um strip off the graphics. Yeah. Well, so the aluminum, the uh the eyelets for the blue yeah. tarps, they, yeah. they have the little brass or whatever. And when they move, they rub and they leave little smileys on the side of your RV. So that's kind of what we call them. Um the, 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 I guess the big difference, and will will a blue tarp keep the water out of your RV? Yep. It will, but it'll also keep all the moisture in your RV, um, and it can create damage if you're tying it down because uh, tarps will billow, um, and so will covers. The biggest damager of a cover is the wind. Um, when it billows and rubs against protrusions on the interior or the exterior of your RV, um, causing wear marks, and then at one point it, it will typically wear through if you're not paying attention to it. Um, a, a traditional RV cover has a vinyl roof on it or a vinyl top to, to keep that down, but the, the, the walls, the sidewalls are breathable. So it allows moisture to escape. Um, it is going to be able to unzip and zip to allow you to get into the coach. Um, there's provisions to tighten it up, kind of like a lacing up a boot. The front and the back of a real RV cover has that. So you can uh, take it and tighten it down and, and uh, minimize the billowing. So um, this it, is Chris's not, explanation there. Can you, see, can you see Chris's explanation? Yeah, I can see it. It's like putting a greenhouse over your RV for the winter. Yeah, right, right. There's a reason why RV covers have – they're breathable. Yep. It's to allow them to breathe, allow the, the, the moisture to get – like everything to get out of it. And if you take a blue tarp and you just cover it, A, you're attracting the sun, like the UV rays, by a lot more than a regular RV cover would be. Who well, wants to answer Jim Convoy's question? What's Jim's question? Uh, oh, how about the pros and cons winterizing with RV antifreeze or blowing out the lines with antifreeze in the plumbing traps? Now, I personally, I don't blow them out. I've never done that. I'm more of an antifreeze guy. I just believe that there's too many nooks and crannies and places that water can sit. And how do you, you can't blow out a can that has an ice maker, a washing machine, and a dishwasher. You just can't blow those out. I I just I, I'm a huge believer in running antifreeze through it. People that blow there is people that blow them out, and I'm not I'm not knocking that, but I just I'm a huge believer in running antifreeze through all the places that it needs to be. Hundred mm. percent. Um, displace the water with non toxic antifreeze. Um, it, it, just like Ryan said, there today's RV is not the RV that was built 20 years ago that had a hot, two sinks, a shower, and a hot water heater. Um, those blow them out. Those are easy. Um, I wouldn't, I would never guarantee anything that was blown out just because I'm not hundred percent sure unless I can fill it with antifreeze. But, um, today's camper is more like our house. I mean, every year people are, what people are attracted to is more, um, residential. And so when, with that being said, we've got water manifold systems. We brought residential refrigerators with ice makers into our plumbing systems. Um, we've, we've added, um, different types of hot water heaters we've got on-demand hot water heaters that have heat exchangers in them and places that store water so 
it, it is not the camper of old. These campers today that re really need to be done appropriately. And if you're not 100% sure, have it done by a professional like Ryan or myself or my teams. Um, it, it will cause you issues in the spring if you do not. <laughs> and it will cost you money, <laughs> right? Very plant. You say you do both. I assume you mean blowing them out in the antifreeze. But why would you do both when there seems to be benefits to not, well, not blowing them? Uh, Some people blow them out first, and then they add antifreeze to them. But I mean, to me, that's just maybe, an extra maybe, legal well, maybe that's what Jerry. Maybe that's what Jerry means. I, I talk so a lot of the forums and things like that right now. People are talking about blowing them out before they put the antifreeze in, and I feel that that's a, just like Ryan said, an extra step. It's a waste of time at my labor rate. Um, I know if I displace the non-toxic antifreeze appropriately, I do not need to blow it out first to uh, get a successful winterization. Good point. And I think it's very, very important for the for the new for the newbies that may be watching the show for the first time. And you hear the word antifreeze and RV antifreeze and automotive antifreeze are two totally separate products and are not interchangeable. Am I correct, guys? Yeah, I actually, I showed up to a job this morning. I called, the guy called me the other day about winterizing and I showed up this morning and he had mentioned to me the other day, hey, I have a couple gallons of antifreeze. Can you use them? I said, yeah, I don't, you know, I have my own stuff, but if you want to use yours, that's fine. And he went to hand me, I think it was um, Valvoline antifreeze for your car this morning. And I'm like, uh, no, one's toxic and one's not toxic. And you can't use the toxic one unless you want to maybe grow a third eye in the fall. Or so, I mean, springtime. <laughs> How about uh, John Senesi? Sen what about oh, the batteries? batteries then? So part of a winterization process on a, a travel trailer, fifth wheel, a towable product, um, I, I am making recommendations for the customer to bring that battery into the garage, fully charge the battery on a bench if you've got a bench charger. If you don't, you can plug the camper in for a day or two. Get that battery fully charged. Take a picture of it before you remove the wires. Print that picture and put it in the camper. <laughs> um, that will save you some time in the spring and maybe a few blown fuses or a call to a guy like Ryan to have him come fix it in your yard. Um, <laughs> uh, and then bring the battery in and put it in the basement. Put it up on a board so it's not in contact with 54-degree cement because that's what cement is in New England. Um, below eight feet in the ground because of thermodynamics and, and put a tender on it once a month if you can and your battery will last longer and, ex and hold a charge better if you maintain it properly. If you let it go dead on the A-frame of your trailer, the sulfuric acid will turn to water at one point. It'll probably split and crack the battery and you'll be replacing it in the spring. I always, I always, like you said, Randall, I always recommend people to either take the battery out if they can or just leave your, if you have the capabilities, leave the trailer plugged in all, all year. People, a lot of people ask me, is it okay to leave your trailer plugged in all the time? Well, yes, it is because the, the converter is going to charge your battery, but the converter has an on off switch inside of it. It doesn't, it will never overcharge your battery unless, unless there's an issue. And a charged battery won't freeze. Correct. Yeah. No, we talk about questions that might be seem to be basic questions, but every time I bring one up, the two guys at the bottom of the screen have a real life story about that situation, such as the antifreeze that uh, we just talked about. Randy, I'm sure that uh, you've got some crazy stories in all your years. I've, I've had to make that phone call where someone is actually winterized with a Prestone or, you know, a vehicle antifreeze that will actually, it, you won't grow a third eye, it will kill you because it shuts down your kidneys um, no. and it'll kill you dead. And so I had to call the customer and tell him that we, we have red flagged his uh, plumbing system as in, into non-use. And we, I, I capped it off on both ends. So it, it could not enter the coach or um, be accessed by someone by accident. Um, Pete's RV. Um, I, I, I talk about this regularly. We use, um, glycol, um, to winterize our campers and our customers campers. There's a couple different flavors out there. There's alcohol blends, um, there is straight alcohol antifreeze. It's non-toxic, but it's actually going to damage damage your packings, damage the O-rings and the seals and your your fixtures, i.e. your faucets and things like that. It also, today's camper has PEX plumbing in it, which is a plastic piping system, um, which takes freezing great. <laughs> but um, it will get, per uh, alcohol antifreeze will permeate that plastic plumbing system and actually leave a foul odor. 
and a foul taste in your plumbing system over the winter months, which is really hard to get rid of. So um, my recommendation is 100% glycol antifreeze, which is actually a food preservative, and it tastes like sugar water. So it's pretty safe stuff. And if you're not sure if it's winterized, <laughs> taste it. <laughs> I, I will I, I do not run alcohol antifreeze through anybody's campers. It it just it does it reeks it, it's a it smells in the springtime and b it's just it's not good for the rubber seals especially the toilet seals if it's sitting in the toilet all winter long that rubber mid seal in the toilet is gonna it's gonna leak it's gonna it's gonna not leak it's gonna drip it's not gonna hold water and then yep. it's flammable <laughs> yeah yeah and it, and, and 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 you know it, it's a little bit more money for the sugar based glycol antifreeze. But in the end, it's worth it, and it, it helps preserve all your seals and everything in your water system. Another question from John. Next question from John. Regarding stabilizer jacks, up or down during winter storage? I would say that, to me, that doesn't really matter. Um, if you don't need them down, there's no sense in having them down. There's no purpose to have them down. If, if, you know, if you're not using your trailer and the refrigerator's not on and stuff, there's really no need to have your stabilizers down. I Same as Ryan. I, if it doesn't need to be deployed, why deploy it and put it in the elements? And if it's a, like a hydraulic uh, leveling system, I, I would like to keep the hydraulic pistons up in the, the, the body of the, the jack itself rather than exposed to the elements if I can. Um, and if I can't, I'm probably spraying them with a silicone spray to help uh, keep any elements off them, uh, detract any water that may sit around on it. Yep. Hey guys, yeah, go, the, go ahead, Lauren. Yeah. If those if those cylinders are sitting out in the elements all winter long and they're susceptible to to moisture and stuff, then they can start pitting, and then you're going to have the when the when the pitting starts and the cylinder goes up and down in, inside the the piston goes up and down inside the cylinder, it's going to score the seals, and eventually you're going to have a leak. Yeah. Hey, along those same lines about uh, winter outdoor winter storage. Um, Randy, you talked about the high grass versus low grass earlier. There are people that store their units on grass. There are some that store their units on asphalt and some that store their units on concrete. Um, at the same time, is it best or is it a waste of time to um, get some small pieces of plywood to put between the ground and the tire? Does that have any impact at all or is it like the dryer sheets so 100 has impact um tires rubber has waxes oils and polymers in it that keep them malleable pliable um and when we're not distributing those waxes oils and polymers through the units it's where the tires start to break down sun is probably the biggest killer of tires so even through the winter months i i'm a strong advocate of putting tire covers on especially if you've got like south facing uh part of your campers on south facing or ca catching a brunt of the sun for most of the day if you are parking on a lawn, uh, it, it, my recommendation is put it up on a board. I would probably go a little bit further, John, not plywood unless you're doubling it up just because plywood may split when we put significant weight on it, where if I got a two by six or a two by eight, I'm cutting them in four foot lengths and putting both my wheels on it or two separate boards and putting my wheel on that. If your rubber is against continuous moisture or wet, it will deteriorate the rubber in that area. So, um, if you're parking on the lawn because you have to park on your lawn for storage, put it up on some boards. If you can park it on hard pan or concrete or asphalt, like you mentioned, that's the best um, because the water will not stay there. It won't stay moist. It will dissipate with wind um, if it rains and it will not uh, shorten the life of your tires as parking on your lawn. So cover the tires for the winter. And if you're on the, a moist, moist soil or lawn, put it up on some boards to get it away from that constant mm -hmm. contact. All right, we're going to take a, a break here. John, if you would uh, check some of the comments and uh, try to get ourselves a uh, little ad in for Seacoast RV. Not a little ad, a big ad. I got No, I got I got two small ads. Oh, the little ones, the yep. video. Okay. But they got uh, a big sale going on. You know, they're, they're up in Maine, so they don't want to keep all those trailers during the winter. So their Winnebago hikes have all been reduced to 19.9. That's, that's a help on a Winnebago hike, and you can see the other ones with the Voyage and the Mini on all of the Winnebago trailers, and they also have a package deal that if you buy a, if you buy a Winnebago hike one, you get a Winnebago hike 100 when you buy an in-stock Winnebago Revel 
motorhome. So you get the motorhome and the hike for only $189.9. The package price is $255 on that. So you can buy the Class B to have when you want to run around and go for the weekend. And if you're going to take the kids, you can just tow the uh, Winnebago hike behind it. So that's our sponsor, Seacoast RV Route 1 in Saco, Maine. Great family fun on Route 1. All right. And you know, so many, so many great comments tonight. And the interesting part about this audience is that um, they ask questions, but they, I mean, our audience is, is a knowledgeable group of people. So Walter was smart enough to bring up about ice makers and washing machines, um, brought up a lot of this, um, what do you call it, conversation about that. Um, the Hawes, if you're ever going to cover it, use an RV cover, not a tarp. Jerry says he... He does his work. Let's get another comment there, too. They yep. leave it plugged in to a timer, runs the charger for five hours each day early morning, saves on the electric bill at the house. So good, bad, good thing to do. Yeah, it's always a good thing to, to keep your batteries charged. Well, yeah, but if you just left the unit plugged in and you got a safety valve in there, it's not going to overcharge it. So does the does it still use electricity if it's not charging the battery? Well, if you're plugged into the house, if your trailer is plugged in, the converter is always going to be on. On it's going to be it's it may not be charging the battery, but it's a good, it's going to be on. So you're going to drop power. out. Yep. Okay, so so Walt does make sense. Then he just runs it for five hours, let it do its job, and then shuts down. When you plug in your camper, you're putting about a two and a half to five amp load on the circuit from the converter, depending if you're charging the battery or not. So like Ryan said, there's constant use. Um, there's It's a transformer. You're making 12 volt power out of 120 volt power a second you plug that in. So um, I, Walter has made this comment before in the years past because I, I remember it and I thought it was a really good idea. Um, he does have a timer on it and he keeps his battery charged that way, which I think is pretty smart. So I'd be interested to see Walter for next year Go a week with or a month or one one cycle for the electric bill without the timer and one with it and tell us what the difference is. Well, he, he can't do that this year. He sold the fifth wheel and he hasn't oh. got a motor home yet. So he's 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 in he's in between. So he's he's staying in hotels this winter. Let's move around in the RV just a little bit and talk about generator care during the winter. Um, anything you should do um, before putting it to bed and secondly. Is there a recommended circumstance where you start the generator um, throughout the winter at all? And if so, what kind of load would you have on it? Me, me, me. <laughs> go ahead, dude. Go ahead, Ryan. No, go ahead. So I'm going to even back it up further from that is put fuel stabilizer in your gas engine and put fuel stabilizer in your diesel engine. Make sure you run it up into the rail um, if you're fuel injected. Um, get it in there, especially with the diesel. You're putting the, the, the diesel um, coach away um, with a uh, with, uh, summer blend in it. There is a different blend for the winter because diesel fuel does gel. Um, so it's cut with kerosene um, in, in the winter months. And by the time you put yours away, that kerosene isn't being used yet. So some stabilizer there. I also, and with the gasoline engines, um, we have a lot where if you're running an 87 octane, which most of us are because of the fuel cost today, um, there is ethanol in your um, uh, gas, and so it, it, we've got uh, we, we've got issues with that um, when it starts to separate, um, affecting again our our fuel injection systems and our small carburetors and our generators. So that that will take that. I am a huge huge advocate of getting out there and starting your motor coach once a month if you've left the batteries in it. Let's keep the seals wet in the engine. Let's continue to have that fuel move through it so it's not sitting around and varnishing. From sitting around for long periods of time and start your generator i will tell my customers to let them both come up to temperature um once a month if you can if you're stored on site and that will not hurt anything <laughs> um you, you brought up diesel and gas how about propane any anything in particular with that I, I will start a propane generator if the battery is still in the coach once a month um just because i want to i want to exercise that generator generator has i don't know if you guys uh, um inside a generator we have a stator and a rotor um, and, and we've got brushes that actually make physical contact with the inner workings of the generator. And when that sits around for a long period of time, actually it can corrode. 
So running your generator once a month just keeps all that stuff clean and anything that moving parts moving appropriately and working in conjunction with each other. So if you can start a generator once a month, you're going to be better off. Um, if you are in a travel trailer or a fifth wheel situation with, um, or say like a high end fifth wheel, it's got the LP generator in it and you've removed the batteries to save the batteries um, cause you're not leaving it plugged in. I would probably just let that generator sit for the winter months and then fire it up in the spring. But if I've got batteries in it, fire it once a month. Let yep. it go. The biggest thing too is, is, is like he said, running something through the gas, because what happens, especially in the gas generators is the ethanol actually it's it it creates a varnish in the carburetor and the cho uh, the uh, float will actually stick so the generator won't run interesting so you know we talk frequently of uh, newbies all the new people getting out there now they're coming in off a year or two have you noticed an increase in the amount of time that you have to spend with people explaining the basics of the rv that they just neither didn't get the training or didn't read the book or what have you? Um, me personally, it's, it's different for every customer. I mean, you get people that they, they catch on real quick. They, they, they know a lot. They are lifelong campers and, you know, they can figure out their new campers and stuff. And you get the people that they've been doing it for 10 years and they still need to be taught things. So it's, it's just, there's, there's different personalities out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, people are wired different ways. Um, I, I did an orientation with a couple that purchased a Class C um, yesterday afternoon, super nice people. And we spent three hours going over it with them because they had great questions. Um, they, they understood the, the, the basic functionality of the RV. But when we were looking at the different devices, they, they were smart people. They, they, they used a lot of common sense and they had really good common sense questions. Um, some people, man, you can talk to your blue in the face and they just don't understand. And so you smile at those guys, give them the keys and tell them to have fun. <laughs> yeah. um, and there's some people that way overthink things. So you kind of got to reel those people back. Uh, yeah. The biggest thing that I, I try to um, get the point across when I'm instructing someone on the use of an RV, common sense. And these things are fairly simple. Don't make them more complicated than they are. Yeah. And when you kind of can keep that mindset, they're, they're fairly simple to use. Um, when you don't, um, you can have some problems or have some difficulties, right? So, Randy, would you suggest um, videotaping the walkthrough? Yeah, I would. And we get videotaped all the time. And, and, and the reason being is I, I give you so much, and Ryan, I'm sure will attest to this, we give you so much information in yeah. a short amount of time. I know that there's no way in that, that you could retain that amount of information. Yeah. Where at least with the video, you can go back and refer to it as you start using the coach. And what did he say here? And what did he say there? I've actually even shot videos, individual videos on uh, the appliances and the devices throughout a coach. So um, once you get it home, you can go ahead and refer back to the videos if you've got a problem yeah. or your the functionality wasn't there when you start using it for sure. So uh, bring a bit, bring your phone, wipe out all those pictures and bring some good memory and charge the battery and absolutely record us. Yeah. You know, there's a, you know how many people are out there that um, with a suburban water heater that sometimes on a suburban water heater, your 120 volt electric element, there's only a button on the outside. So a lot of people, they run it on propane for, and for until they don't know, until they know, until somebody tells them, Hey, you know, you can run this on electric. There's a button outside or, I get a call saying, hey, my electric's not working. There's a button inside because sometimes they'll put a button inside and outside on the water heater. And sometimes it's just outside. So they put the button on. They're like, hey, I don't have hot water. So you got to put the button on the outside, too. So stuff like that, uh, you, you try to explain to people. But, you know, me, myself and Randall and I'm sure his guys, we know all this stuff. So when we're explaining it to people, I've had to tell myself to slow down and try to come across as it as if i don't know it and i'm or as if i know it but i'm trying to explain it to them so that they understand instead of just going yeah you got a button out there you got to do this that and you know because people they're so excited to get their camper they just they don't pay attention sometimes in putting it in and when we're we're industry guys and we 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 walk the walk and talk the talk every day and when you bring somebody into our world that doesn't do that sometimes you got to put it in layman's terms and and if you're 
if you're unaware of that while you're discussing it with them or trying to tell them, then, then, then you probably have the wrong job. <laughs> so you, you got to get in there and, and, and make it make it make sense to them and make sure that they're familiar or comfortable with your answer for sure. Even explaining on jobs when I do jobs, because I'm I'm at the people's houses or their campground. And I always try to explain the process of either if, you know, some people. Some people stand over my shoulder the whole time I'm working and they watch me. So I try to explain to them what I'm doing, what I'm looking for, what's going on, just so they know that maybe if something like this happens again and it's an easy fix, they might be able to fix it. Not saying I don't want the business. I'm just saying if it's something simple, you can teach somebody something and maybe they'll use that in the future. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Maybe. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, but I've winterized John's camper for the last three years, and he still doesn't know how to do it or anything. So. No, I, I, I watched you do it this time, Ryan. And as I watched, you mean, as I watched you move the hoses around, I said, "I'm never going to get this right." You mean he, he doesn't try to tell you how to do it? No, no, <laughs> I'm just watching all that water gurgling out of the hot water heater that uh, that was there. I can't believe that there's that much water in that, and. Uh, you know, you got all the hoses and you got the, the, the uh, it, you know what, Walter Swenson, I, and Jerry and all you guys that can do it on your own. I respect your capabilities. I ain't trying it. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't right. trying it. <laughs> so, so John's going on this 12 day trip, leaving apparently from Worcester, going to Arizona. Any, any advice for John? Does he have to Dewinterize it here or halfway across the country. When are you, when are you leaving? Uh, about the couple days after Christmas. Uh, I would dewinterize till I get to Georgia. Oh, are you going south and then across? Where are you going? We're going down to Tallahassee and then meeting about 30 other units and convoying across I 10 to Quartzsite. I'd say, you know, in December, I'd say by the time you get to like the Maryland area ish, you, you're probably all right. Yeah. Well, see what I'm going to do. I, I think what I'm going to do is if I get a week like in November before Thanksgiving, the week before Thanksgiving, get it down there then. And um, then I don't have the snow issues to worry about, because if, you know, I, I if I left on December 26th, 27th, I could get stuck somewhere in uh, New Jersey, you know, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Uh, you know, once you get to Virginia, I think you're OK. But. You know, even in good weather, go, going down uh, the week between Christmas and New Year's down to Florida is is a challenge. But I think what I'm going to do is um, winterize up. Well, I'll keep it winterized until I'm ready to go and then not not touch it until I get to Georgia. Um, Ryan, you, you mentioned earlier that there were three campgrounds that stay open all year long. And Randy, do you, do you know of any? So if any of our fans want to do winter camping, I think Danforth Bay stays open, don't they? Coldbrook too, right? Right. Uh, Coldbrook's not open year round anymore. Oh, no more. So it's um, in Bellingham. It's called the Circle CG Campground. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's. And then cool. um, yep. up in Ashby, Mass, it's called the Pine Campground. And then. Um, uh, the other one is, I believe, in Surbridge. I, I, I believe the um, it used to be Yogi Bear. It's called. Um, yeah, it's a nice place. Uh, it's what's it called now? Pine Lodge. Yeah. Pine Pine. Uh, they redid the whole place. It's right. beautiful. Yeah. They, they, totally somebody told me, somebody told me today that they're open year round there too. Yeah. How about your neck of the woods, Randy? Yeah. Up in uh, the Chittenden County area in Vermont. There is two off the top of my head that I can think of, but it's more, we don't see like the in-transit people going in and out. It's more people that are there seasonally, um, typically because they have to be. Um, it, it, I, I don't think the market is there for us just because of how far north we are for where we've got a lot of people that are coming up looking for a campground. If yeah. they're coming up into the area with their RV, they have a destination like a ski area or a a Burlington, Vermont, or a Ben and Jerry's, or something like that, and they're going to utilize those areas rather than get a, get a site at a campground. They're usually just there passing through, right? Yeah. Now, keep in mind too, those campgrounds I just mentioned, I do believe they're only open year round for seat for people people that are going to live there. They're not going to 
Oh, you can't pull up there on January 16th and say, hey, I want a site. They're, your camper, I believe, has to be there by a certain time. That's a good point, um, Ryan. So you, you're on your own. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I think maybe the one in Surbridge that I'm talking about, and I, I wish I could think of the name of it, but they might they, they might be able to, you might be able to pull up to their, them and go in. But I know the one in Ashby and the one in Circle PG in Bellingham, I do believe that it has to be on site by a certain time. And then that like your seasonal basically for the winter season. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Um, Jerry, thank you for that note on Carolina Crossroads. I, I know I've gone by it. It's right on 95. And, um, you know, another thing to keep in mind is that if you get too far down in the south, you might find yourself with some techs that have never done this before because <laughs> they don't have to do it much. And, oh, yeah, I can do that. And then they screw up. Um, so... I'm leery and they, 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 they have a really good recommendation. They put the car antifreeze in instead of the yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So Estelle says Meredith Woods is open year round because they do a lot of snowmobiling up there. Jerry says Ace is high. Carolina Crossroad Road is where a lot of people de winterize. Interesting. You know, I don't know if Bob remembers it, but when we went to a show, I can't remember where it was, whether it was in Louisville or uh, but they have these um, truck. They have these truck campers that you take them off the truck, and you drop them onto you know for ice fishing. The trailer, and, yeah, the fish house, the fish yeah. house. And mm -hmm. you drop them off the bed, put it right down on the ground, and then there is yeah, while you're sitting inside it. Yeah, follow oh, through. Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, there was, a, there was a manufacturer. I remember when I worked for my father, uh, he had one we were selling um, that actually made a it was it, it was a, a travel trailer, probably like a 16, 18 footer. Um, I don't Morris think. It was, probably, yeah. Morris and Morris makes an LCI actually makes special suspension to drop it. Yeah. To yeah. The yeah. Ice. It drops it all the way down, down, right over the wheels. Right. I worked on them. Down, and then and you get to the, drill out and drill your, drill your hole and stick your. Yeah. Fishing pole down and do but it. But you're sitting in a warm room with possibly a TV on, with a stove yep. right there. <laughs> yep. We used yeah, to this. take we used to take old pop ups, um, and <laughs> when the canvases went bad on them, we'd put the top up permanently. We'd plywood all the way around it, and we'd pull everything out with the furnace and the two seats. You'd drill some holes in the floor, and you'd drop some sauna tubes down and pull it behind your four wheeler or whatever. Get it on the ice and ice fish with them. They're great. You sit in there with smoking cigars, drinking beers in your t-shirt, and catch a get fish all night Wait, long. What, was, what, what, what did the sauna tubes do? Keep the air out so that we would take a sauna tube and drop it to the ice so that yeah. the air couldn't come up. The cold air couldn't come up. Oh. So we just put a pipe down to the ice, so right down to the hole. <laughs> I see. All right. Okay. Yeah, Don says they're huge in Minnesota. The guy from Texas, where they camp year-round, says oh, they're huge. In I would have to I would have to measure that ice and make sure it's really, really, really thick before I went out there and sat in a camper with a right. fern running right. with body heat going because I wouldn't want to end up my camper being a boat at the end of the day. But that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. Although they have all those houses up at Winnipesaukee. I mean, they're real houses. Oh, I know. I know. I just, I just, I, that's just me being me. I, I don't know. Just pulling, pulling, you know, a, a 5,000 pound camper out there and then heating up the area that you're sitting yeah. on. is just, um, I don't know. Just me. But, but Ryan does, he's concerned about that, but he'll also drag race at 150 <laughs> miles an hour. <laughs> Depending on a parachute to stop them. Anyway. Uh, do you have do you have sponsors on your car, or is it just sponsored by Trick? It's Trick RV. That's our number one sponsor. He does. He pays us really well to sponsor the car. Well, that's that's yeah. good. He's got deep and the, the and the government. Yep, you know, the government knows it too. <laughs> yeah, because yeah. they already asked about it. <laughs> oh yeah. Good. yeah. But, you know, these guys are so good. They're so knowledgeable. That's the thing. You can throw any question out at them. Hey, you, um, now, are you guys going to be available for our show this year? Uh, Chris is not. Chris is teaching in Pennsylvania. So I'm probably going to do a video with Chris. Now, we got a conflict 
with Connecticut, but Joe's not doing any seven S anymore. Right? Oh, no more. Randy? Um who's not doing? It? I'm sorry. Joe. Joe Gonzalez. Joe Gonzalez on the Hartford show. Oh, um, Joe, um, last year we didn't have any at Hartford, but he did at Mohegan. So uh -huh. um if you you're the same weekend as Joe over there? Right. Yeah, this year. Yeah. Yeah. I am uh I'll be available. Are you gonna be available, Randy? I think so. I'm not I'm not sure which show I'm working, but if you put me down and then I'll know. <laughs> I, I was actually kind yeah, of thinking I'll tell you I'll tell you, Randy, you're working the Boston show. <laughs> All right, perfect. <laughs> We should do like a round table kind of thing with you and I, you know, we each do our seminars and stuff. And then maybe you do like a round table kind of thing with question and answers and stuff. You know, with the and audience. that worked real well last year with Walter Swenson. And yeah. I think we had a yeah. camper. Yeah, it's got camper camper round, round yeah, the, table. Yeah, it was, it was I, campers I, done by camp, camper. Yeah, camper seminar done by campers and what have you. Yeah, I, I, I talked to Scott Byer this morning. In fact, I, I interviewed him for our camper report show this week, and he's got he's got some good ideas. But yeah, that's a good idea. Have you do your individual ones, but then do one, and and then you might need some help. So if you don't mind, we'll just put the Petro on the panel with you and Randy. And, you know, so I think he, that would be awesome. One so of the he, most so he can answer the real tough questions. One of the most fun seminars that I did last year, and I almost think it was in Boston. It, it was later at night, so the attendance wasn't huge. Um, and I think I had like six or eight people and I was just like, tell you what, why don't you guys get to hang out with an RV expert? Why don't you just ask me whatever questions you want and we'll hammer it out. And we had the best time. We ended up starting talking about politics and all sorts of different stuff in RV. And the people were like just getting a lot. I think like phone numbers were exchanged for people that made friends at this little thing that we just did. And we had yeah. a great time. So I think well, I would love to do that with Ryan. If you want to put us in a room where yeah. people can ask us questions, I think that'd be a lot of fun. You would, and, and and but that's because RV technicians are the nicest men and women in our business. You know, they don't sell them; they fix them. So we, we need to be a lot the guy that sells it to us. You right. know, we're, we're we're nice until we get on a job where it really, really irritates us, and then sometimes the the meanness comes out. Not to people, just to myself. <laughs> like some choice words come out of my mouth sometimes, but I have to be really quiet because usually. The, customers within walking distance of me but but <laughs> one thing that that took place on monday when ryan was um working on my winterization and um matt fuller was there and i had introduced those guys they hadn't met before but maybe had spoken over the phone but just watching the synergy of two guys who really knew what they were talking about talking about stuff that, i mean i was so far on the <laughs> fringe of that conversation um but it was cool because y y you throw two people from the same field together uh and that's the cool part about the rv lifestyle i think is that around the campfire you've got every different uh socioeconomic aspect um sharing a fire and um you know i'll tell you one thing if i was at a campground I'd much rather be camping next to a person who was a plumber, mechanic, or an electrician than a banker or a um, insurance executive, because I'm totally useless when it comes to fixing my stuff. Uh, and I know those guys would be over there in a minute helping me out. Yeah, we got Jerry Plant that we can pull from this year also. Yep. 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 Um, great yep. Deal. Jerry. Right now, we're almost out of time, so I got a, I got a quiz for you. Oh, boy. Did you know? <laughs> have, have any of you noticed anything different about tonight's show? Uh, you know how many black angels? You got it. Oh. Now, the reason the reason I don't have Jack Daniels, we were up against it with Facebook screwing up everything beforehand, and we were trying all kinds of different things, and we were able to get it to work. We kind of overrode the system. And then all of a sudden we went live, and then about ten minutes later, I said, "Damn!" <laughs> even, and my wife's not here tonight. I couldn't even send her a text. She's not even here tonight. <laughs> but I, I think it Swenson or uh, Tim Tim Christensen would have picked that up. Or uh, no, Walter Burns did. Huh? Walter, Walter Burns? Burns did. Look, he just posted a JD. There you go. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Good good thing there. I'm going to see you in. Uh, Las Vegas, 
Mr. Burns pretty soon, week and a half or so. And Walt, Walt Burns and Easy Care will have Neil Portnoy drawing for during the cocktail hour and I think during the lunch the next day after. So Neil will be with Walter and the gang at Easy Care this year out in uh, out in Las Vegas. All right. And will be had by all. Yes. All right, guys, thanks very much. We'll catch up to you down the road. And, and uh, thanks, E. Okay, all right, we'll do that. Yep. And uh, I'm going to do one more ad for our good friends at Seacoast. And I'll, I'll let you take out that one and then see if I can maybe do the uh, uh, final music. Try try that, John. You do that. <laughs> let, me can, let me see if I can get the last video going. A special thanks to Kenny and Amanda and all the crew at Seacoast RVs for sponsoring tonight's show. Proud sponsor of RVing in New England, Rock Elevation, Winnebago, Tobles, and Motorized. It is the place to go for everything RVing, creating family fun on Route 1 at Seacoast RVs. Okay. All right, folks. We will see you down the road. This edition of RVing in New England was a presentation of the New England RV Dealers Association. Thanks for watching, and be sure to like us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram.